Hello and welcome back to another episode of You Want to Do What with Dan and Julie. Today we've got Lucas on, who is a landscape artist. Hi, Lucas. Hello, guys. How are you? All good. All good. And it's morning in British Columbia right now, isn't it? It is. It's uh, 10 a.m. What's the time over there? Six o'clock at night. Uh, It's very dark and cold and wet. And (laughs) I'm living in the past. Well, it's also cold and wet and dark here. So (laughs) there we go. Um, Lucas, do you want to tell everyone a little bit about what you actually do? Absolutely. So um, I am an artist and I specifically uh, work on painting large, large scale, realistic depictions of nature. So sometimes here I say I'm a landscape artist and people assume that I trim their lawns. Um, it's actually painting landscapes. <laughs> so, I, yeah, that's it. And I live in this on the Sunshine Coast, which is just outside of Vancouver in British Columbia, surrounded by incredible nature. And um, basically what I do is I go and explore landscapes, sometimes by myself, sometimes with clients. And then I um, either paint outside or I take it to my studio and paint there. I was going to say where you are is is a very good place to be painting landscapes. Oh, that yeah. is a beautiful Absolutely. area of the world. Totally. And it's kind of what got this whole thing started for me. So so where did this sort of passion for art come from, Lucas? Uh, well, Daniel, I have to take you back to my sweet, sweet childhood uh, <laughs> <laughs> many decades ago. No, well, not that many. Um, so I was um, born in Argentina in South America. And I grew up mainly in Patagonia, which is this incredible, um, very wild region in the south of Argentina and Chile um, with incredible nature. And my dad was a painter, even though he didn't do it professionally, but he would always paint and do photography and everything. And then my grandfather, um, who was Austrian, uh, he was a proper painter. Uh, He, since age I think 10 or something, went to like an arts academy. And then uh, he lived his whole life just having adventures and painting. And he ended up settling in, um, in Patagonia. And uh, on that family ranch, he hand built some cottages. And that's where we would spend uh, big chunks of every year. And growing up, my life essentially looked like um, going on hikes, uh, exploring the, 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 the property, building tree forts. Uh, oh, and wow. if it was raining or it was dark, I was inside either um, cooking, painting, doing sculpture, building models. Uh, and, and to give you, a, to paint the picture, like until I was 10, um, there wasn't even electricity. We had like uh, kerosene lamps. Oh, and God. so forget it about Nintendo 64s, Playstations, <laughs> televisions. There was none of that. <laughs> Oh, wow. What a, what a place to grow up. So I know. Art, art was kind of, it's always, it's been in your blood and you've always done it from a young age then. It, exactly. So it never felt like, Ooh, now I'm going to learn art. Uh, now I'm going to learn how to paint or this or that. It was just, that was the thing to do. You know, some people with their parents, they play uh, football. Uh, some people, I don't know, they read or they ride horses. For me, the thing was to do was painting. And I, and I actually, i like, I really loved it. Like I have two siblings and they didn't, even though they're, they're really good at it, they didn't um, latch on to it as much as I did. So there was a mixture of um, nurture. So it was like the, the possibility was there, but also I had a keen interest in it. So with your family, obviously, uh, teaching you from a, long, a young age, did you actually take on any formal training to become an artist? Yeah. So then when I was in, in high school and I wanted to kind of get more specific... Um, like more into sculpture actually and uh, so my, my dad was working so I said okay like let's why don't we just get you to go somewhere where you can actually learn and do this more so for seven years I um, I did like an apprenticeship with um, with a with a great artist who sadly passed away last year but um, a great Argentine um, artist who was a sculptor painted like an all-rounder uh, and also a great teacher and great mentor so Um, for seven years, I think since age 11 till 19, I would go twice a week, four hours at a time to just train in sculpture and painting. Um, and it was, it was pretty much like the old style of, 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 well, not, not fully the old style, but it was, um, just me being there and 
essentially I would do the project that I wanted and he would teach me and show me how to do it and how to just improve my craft, which I really appreciated. So that was, that was kind of my formal training. Wow. And then <laughs> when the time came to go to university, um, maybe I'm stealing your next question here, but <laughs> no, I, uh, I, I actually um, didn't go to an art school because two things happened. One, uh, first, because this whole thing of art was so natural to me and it felt more like, okay, this is just what I enjoy doing. I never re- actually sought out to do it um, professionally. Also having seen or heard kind of um, how, even though my granddad did it for his whole life, it was kind of a struggle. Uh, and then my dad, he, of course, he, I mean, he didn't do it professionally. He, he, he worked for 30 years at a, at a pharmaceutical company, but he would only paint on the sides. So he would foster it to me, but um, he was always giving me leeway to do whatever I wanted, but he was never like, oh, you should definitely go into arts. You should do whatever you want. But hearing the cliches of what the art world means and how like the cliche of the starving artist and all of that, mm. I actually had no interest in that. Um, and I, I'm also very interested in design and engineering. So I think since I was 13 or something, I actually knew that instead of studying art, I wanted to study design, to design products. Right. And when I was 19, I, I, um, I moved from Argentina to Austria, where my family is originally from, to go study there. And <laughs> I, the first thing, I, I, so I, I enrolled for a, for a really good, um, a very prestigious school for industrial design there. But also I said, well, while I'm here, I'm just going to go and check out the Vienna Arts Academy where my grandfather studied 100 years ago, which, I mean, seeing what he learned should be this incredible place. Mm. And I went to see and they, just, they had the degree show on. And this is not to um, like, um, uh, to, 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 I, I'm trying to find a word that's not a, a swear word. No, you're not to offend <laughs> any, 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 okay. No, no, I rather not. Not to offend any, any, any um, artist coming out of academia nowadays. Like I, I went to see the degree show of people who were, had studied there for seven years. And I thought to myself, none of these guys can actually like paint what I think of painting, right? It was mm. all like splashes on the wall. And it's all about the big text telling you their childhood trauma and whatever. And I didn't want to go to set to school seven years for that. Like to, for me, even though that's, that's valid and that's a very cool thing, it shouldn't be put in the same category as like the art that a Michelangelo, a sergeant, yes. a Bierstadt uh, would do, right? See, I, to me, that is the art that I'm interested in. <laughs> yeah, see, my personal taste is very similar to your taste in art, I mm-hmm. would say. I prefer realism to mm-hmm. impressionism, I think. I, mm-hmm. I think I just I just get that. I, I find it more impressive in a way, to be honest. Mm. I think that's where I come from. Yeah. Yeah. And <clears throat> like, um, I mean, there's, there's, there's great impressionist painters and, and, I, and I love what they did. And there's great surrealism paintings. And to me, like then the, the style or, or the genre itself, like uh, that, that boils down really to, to personal taste. Right. And, and mm. taste may change also throughout one's life like it did for me for certain but um i think what i appreciate about art and i think this is a, probably also what 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 you're referring to is um you know that feeling when you walk into a room and you see something that you go like wow like how 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 did they do that like yeah I, like that would probably take a long time that would probably take a lot of skill um it's not like i can do like the feeling of oh i could have done that and and then the snarky face is yeah, but you didn't. So like that's kind of the justification of like <laughs> a lot of contemporary art. Uh, like okay, you put a toilet upside down and you said this is not a toilet or whatever. Or, this is a pipe I can remember. <laughs> so that's more of an like an intellectual play, right? But to me, the art like the knowing that someone spent thousands of hours behind it to master how pigment on a surface can create the illusion of space and light wow that, that's the kind of stuff that i enjoy so that's um how i got drawn to there so back to the back to the training um i when i went i went to see that degree show that kind of was the nail in the coffin that okay i'm not gonna study art uh, like at least what they're offering out there like i may do a course here and there but uh, to me this is this is not what i'm interested in and so i started design and then i worked as a designer for a couple of years and then i went to also like i had an um, incursion in the movie industry working as a, as a set designer which I found had a lot of art actually in it. 
um, very creative, you know, doing props, you do something that's just up for a couple of weeks and then it's all taken down. And uh, the idea in, in set design is like, it's um, the, the, only, the, the last coat of paint is the only thing that matters, right? So mm. uh, you can, you're, you're creating a cave and it doesn't actually have to be rock. It doesn't have to be, or, or a building doesn't have to be structurally sound. It's really, really creative. It's all about emotions and how it's going to be perceived. So that was super fun. Um, and yeah, and then years later, here I am, and I'm a professional. I would, I guess, you would call it artist. So it's funny. <laughs> and so was that process after <clears throat> obviously working for, uh, as a designer and set designer and things like that? Did mm-hmm. you just sort of fall into becoming a professional artist through presenting your work on social media? Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. Um, I'm of course glad it didn't, but I wasn't searching for it, and I wasn't like craving for it and i think that also was probably one of the reasons why it, it actually did work in retrospective um so we so i moved to austria when i was 19 um then i was i finished my my degree and then when i was working in the movie industry i was living the bachelor's life where i would <laughs> uh work on a movie in austria for maybe like two three months and then fly back to Argentina to spend maybe a month or something in between projects to just like hang out with my friends and date girls and whatever. <laughs> uh, and then uh, go back to Austria. So for a couple of years, I was, I was going back and forth. But then on one of those trips, I reconnected with um, Janine, who is a very integral part of my life. And as you may guess, Janine is... Uh, a woman and she's now my wife uh, and uh, <laughs> she she used to be my childhood sweetheart when we were 10 years old oh wow back in argentina yeah and we we had lost contact for 15 years even though at the end i was frequently let's say frequently stalking her on facebook to see what she was up to <laughs> <laughs> only to discover that she was in one great relationship after another and uh, I was like, oh, that should have been me. And actually, she dated two guys named Lucas in a row. And I was like, God damn it. Anyways, <laughs> at one point, um, my stalking, my intel would tell me that she was single. And I was visiting my family in Argentina. So I, I kind of said, hey, we should get together, you know, talk about life. We haven't seen each other in so long. And, and uh, we met. And long story short, we ended up hooking up. And um, she was originally born here in Canada. Um, but moved back to Argentina at a young age because her, her mother was Argentine. Sorry, I'm doing like a 4D story here with multiple layers. <laughs> That's okay, go keep going. Good. <laughs> and uh, um, and then at one point, so when I when we actually reconnected, like that meant so much to me that I said, okay, actually, like I, I I'm I'm done with with uh, Austria. I, I figured it wasn't compatible, like going back and forth mm. with these movie projects to Austria and then coming back. And she she had no interest in moving to to Europe with me. Um, so I said, okay, I'll, I'm just going to give that away and come back to Argentina and, and see what we can do. So I ended up moving back, uh, moved in with her <laughs> and we started a, a small like, um, design business where we would do handmade wooden objects. So very creative, very fun, but Argentina being the, uh, yeah, just unfortunately, politically and economically unstable place that it is mm. it um it doesn't present too many great um options for for like to, to build up a future as, mm-hmm. a, as a young especially creative individual right yeah um and so i was always kind of telling her hey like it would actually be nice if if we given all the chances that we have the, the cards that we have she has a canadian citizenship if we explored maybe living abroad again and she was like, well, you know what? I, I always had this fantasy about moving sometime to, to live to Canada where I was born. Um, so why don't we try that? And then we were kind of toying with the idea, but then we left it. And then at one point we went to India of all places wow. to do a meditation retreat um, and spent there a month. And for whatever reason, like we kept meeting Canadians at this uh, <laughs> international center, like one after another, and they were all, all so nice and kind of, that got us super fired up and when we came back that was this was um uh when we're coming back Mar- march 15th mm. and uh march 30th we said okay we're moving to canada and june 15th we were in canada so wow. we sold everything 
Uh, we gave everything that we didn't sell away. We gave our apartment away. Our families were like, oh, guys, like, I think you should really think about this. And we're like, no, we know this is what we have to do. <laughs> and then um, we landed here in 2016 with just like two suitcases each. And uh, we started a life from scratch. And so I guess this is a very long answer to your question, Daniel. But uh, we the, the smart thing to do at that time was to get um, like corporate jobs. Yeah. Um, like office jobs full time. Like I wouldn't uh, go straight into starting a, your own business, the entrepreneurial creative business when you just arrive to a country. So I got a job as a designer, uh, which actually funnily enough um, was my only ever uh, like proper office job, you know, nine to five yeah. going to an office <laughs> in, since I left high school. Um, and I lasted surprisingly long, two years <laughs> wow. until I was kind of fired. Uh, which was the best thing ever. And um, <laughs> eh, uh, and then, yeah, like that kind of provided a good structure for us to start here and, and get a good income going and mm. um, kind of look good on paper for what a government wants to see and then get a mortgage, buy a place. And then I got my uh, my resident, my, um, my PR, my uh, permanent residency. And uh, at one point, that uh, that job was feeling really, really dry, especially like the, I mean, I can't speak for everyone, but um, to me personally, the thing of going every day, checking in, and uh, I didn't mind the work, I really enjoyed it, but there were times, and this is just the nature of, of an office work, where office job is where there, there wasn't really anything to do, or I had accomplished all my tasks. Mm. And just because of the structure of the company, there wasn't much room for me to just okay either do whatever or if there's nothing to do just go home so the feeling of standing there sometimes for eight hours straight I couldn't even sit because my back was killing me so I had a standing desk so sometimes I would literally walk in greet everyone go to my desk stand for eight hours just listening to podcasts and then <laughs> walk home and all the time still like having maybe like an old 3d model open pretending to work because they wouldn't give me anything new and if I, they also didn't want me to propose new stuff so Having to pretend to be busy felt like so soul draining. Yeah, office jobs can be difficult. You know, it's sometimes yeah. they're quite old fashioned still in their approach to your hours and um, and and your totally. work sometimes. But totally, I mean, being yeah. a creative person, you're you know, as you are, an office job is hard anyway, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, I think that I think it's a shame because I like the design part of it, like designing the furniture and talking with the owner, who's a fantastic designer and an and incredible business person. Like that part, I really enjoyed. What I didn't enjoy was like the old school structure and, and the like. Okay, if you don't have any work, either find something to do or still sit here in case you need we need you. And that was just like no, I, I can't deal with this. And so I, I I got this, and this this is kind of what I. The, from all this story, like I can kind of trace the, the steps and say, okay, I understand why this happened, why this fell into mm. place, you know, 2020 vision in a way. But the only thing that was kind of like, I think came from some higher power or something like that, that intuitive feeling. Well, two things. One, moving to Canada was kind of like a very strong intuitive feeling that made no sense. And still, I don't know why we did it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, 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 and then this other thing was like, I got this urge one day, I need to paint landscapes. Like I had painted all sorts of stuff previously, like from mm. realism, surrealism. Um, one time I had a very, very big like thing for kind of Renaissance style, um, whatever. But, um, but never any defined style saying, okay, this is what the core of my work is going to be. Uh, and one day I got this craving, okay, I need to paint landscapes. Like they're to just for whatever reason. And so, and big, that was, that was the other thing. So mm. um, I went to, to the art store and, and I bought the biggest canvas they had, which was um, uh, eight by four feet. That's uh, two, two and a half meters by 120 meters. Wow. Um, yeah, which barely fit in our apartment <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and a whole set of, of oil paints because I didn't have any art supplies at the time. Yeah. Uh, I bought everything, uh, light, and I just started painting away on, on a mountain peak that's well known here, which is called the Black Tusk, um, close to Whistler. I don't know if Whistler says anything. It's like a yeah, very, yeah. it's like Vale, like a very famous um, uh, ski, ski town here. Mm -hmm. 
And so I, I started doing this massive painting, much to the uh, complaints of, of Janine, who's like a very <laughs> perfectionist uh, and interior designer who doesn't like uh, very sensitive nose. So she didn't like the smell of the oil paints. Uh, she would go furious every time, like a little stain of oil, which has the tendency <laughs> to just stain everything. Like my clothes started to get dirty, the walls started to get stained. And so Uh-oh. at one yeah, <laughs> she was like, my God, what are you doing? <laughs> so, and, and mind you, we were in a um, 500 square feet apartment, so 50 square meters, so, so tiny, tiny. Um, and at one point, yeah, like I, some friends of ours, they lent me their, their garage to go and paint. They just put their car outside, which was super nice from them, for them from them. Uh, and so that was my first art studio. And I would go literally like after work. So like 6 p.m., I would grab my bike. And especially in the winter, it was already nighttime. It was raining. I would go there, paint for a couple of hours, go back to home and then go in the weekends too. Like I had a massive drive to just go and do this. And wow. I at the time had a minuscule Instagram account, like just my friends, because I was only posting photos of Vancouver, essentially. I didn't even yeah. think much about the platform. And I started putting videos and, and photos of the painting process. And slowly but surely, like more and more local people uh, started catching on because it was kind of something uh, they could recognize. And the style of realism also, what it does is it's, it, like you said, like it, it engage, it can it can kind of engage with everyone, right? Mm. You don't need a a, 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 a museum, um, what do you call, like a curator to tell you much about it. You can just see it and say, oh yeah, I recognize that mountain. That looks super cool. I can't believe it's a painting. Um, and so it started to catch on, catch on, catch on until one day I got a call from a gallery owner saying, hey, we've been watching you paint. It looks incredible. Would you like to work with us? And that's kind of how it started professionally. Are all your... That was probably the longest answer ever. Sorry, Daniel. <laughs> no, it's, it's, cool. Cool. it's cool. Uh, are your landscapes generally uh, images that you see, or do you, do do you just paint a landscape of a ra- like um, an idea like fantasy. of the landscape? Yeah, yeah, precisely. Okay. Uh, no, I'm the, the style and the the theme of what I'm doing now is really um, focusing on accurate accurate. Uh, accurately depicting uh, specific landscapes that are real, uh, kind of paying homage to the beauty that is around us. Mm. So it, it's always real places. However, I always take some creative license to uh, modify and tweak things that that um, don't work well for the composition. You know, sometimes you'll have an ugly tree just standing in front, or there might be a mountain. Like the center, the central parts, like the focal points of my compositions, like I'll, I'm always going to paint them like there are, but maybe the mountains around them, I'll just change a bit to to enhance the composition itself. A bit of and poetic also, license, maybe. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Just because otherwise I would be just like literally copying uh, 100% a photograph. Mm. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, <laughs> people who say, oh, you're just copying a photograph. My my reply is always like, have you ever tried to copy a photograph? It's actually so hard. <laughs> Man. I, I always say that to my uh, my girlfriend. She she likes art, but she kind of likes um, oh, okay. impressionism yeah. and surrealism and things. And she always says, oh, oh it's, yeah. it's like a photograph. You could just take a photograph. And I was like, imagine oh. trying to replicate taking yeah. that photo. It's I find it incredibly impressive myself it's, anyway. It's it. And there are some great artists out there, especially like now with the Instagram world, there are some yeah. that are like, like super famous there if, if i mean that's the word to use but uh we're just literally incredible it but um and also the thing like you can never really copy a photograph like up close at some point there's still brush strokes right and there is a limitation yeah. as to how small your brush is going to be and i pur- purposefully try to not go too small with my brushes and here we're going more into the technical stuff but I um I try to keep my so if you if you look at one of my paintings up close mm. they still look quite painterly um so they're pretty abstract up close but when you walk away at a distance um just because of the scale and the colors and the lighting everything like it it's it it looks real or like a photograph like some people say from 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 a distance but up close they're really surrealistic um but back to your question yeah so i take that little bit of creative license and then also something that i like to do is to um remove uh, any traces of, of human impact, right? So if there's like roads or if there's a high, like <clears throat> sometimes there'll be this random like 
telecommunications antennas on the top of a mountain or or a ski runs like if i'm painting whistler for example mm. uh i i take that all out and i paint the, the forest untouched so like i i study from the composition how the landscape is working naturally like how a natural forest would look like and then i kind of figure how that forest would grow over the stuff that has been removed um as to paint nature untouched as to yeah just give uh, viewers an appreciation for um wow like this place that i know so well where i drive through every day this is what it would look like pristine right and also um this is not something that i said but i i like to say now is that (laughs) this presents the viewer an opportunity to reflect upon the uh, impact of um, human development on nature and uh, gives us something to to think about um, for our future like okay because if you see for example vancouver when you're flying in or you see it on the map you see um it's this this city that's like sprawling right um uh, and and it clashes against the mountains right and you can literally see how the mountain has it looks like a like um say you're you're trimming your beard and you go like with just no clearance and you cut like to your skin and all of a sudden you have this patch of skin showing through your, through your beard mm. there's probably better analogies but <laughs> uh, you see you see the forest of of the mountains yeah uh, be, being shaved off and full of, of of mansions and buildings so it's kind of like this uh this 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 fungus almost that grows into nature right and i mean how privileged we are that we get to be so close to a mountain, but also, wow, what a responsibility not to destroy the whole thing, right? Because so yeah. easily we could just turn the whole thing into a concrete um, pile. So um, that was something someone pointed out that apparently I do. I didn't think about it that way, but yes. yeah, there you go. That's that's the little text I would put next to a painting for, for, <laughs> for the intellectually... Um, hungry people to yeah, to, to chew on <laughs> so you you started to get noticed by a local gallery um you said earlier yes and then how has that developed into now you're a full-time artist and how do you work with your clients and and things like that yes um so the way it started is like th- th- these these people um the owner approached me and and said like hey we've been like watching you paint for the past uh, like a couple of months and um, what you do is really impressive. We don't have uh, any other artists in our roster um, currently who, who paints in that, that, that specific style of realism. It's not the most common style <clears throat> for landscape art, um, but it's something that some people really uh, feel, feel attracted to, especially people who are not necessarily uh, like quote unquote art collectors, but a lot of people who actually really just like nature, right? And they have a relationship to it. Like maybe someone who's passionate about skiing, maybe it's someone who's passionate about climbing. Uh, they just love nature and they would like to bring it into their homes, but rather than having a photograph, they actually would like some art. So this speaks to those people a lot because it's easier to digest than something that's very like the, more of an abstraction of, of landscape, right? And so they were, they were very keen on it. And also the thing with my art is like, it literally takes hundreds of hours to produce each painting. So it has a big price tag to it, right? On mm. an eight foot painting. Um, so it, it also appeals to a certain um, segment of, of the, the population who can afford that type of art, which of course galleries mm, like to cater to. And um, so she was like, okay, We'll uh, just as a welcoming gift, we'll actually pay you your commission up front. Normally, and this is across the board, all commissions take roughly 50 50. They do a 50 50 split, which um, I, yeah, I think it's a lot compared to other industries like music, for instance. A manager will take 10%, 15% maybe of your shows and sales and whatever. Um, but on the other hand, like they, they provide the space, they have their clients, they, um, they, they pay their lease, they pay their uh, employees, and theoretically, they are actively promoting your work, right? Mm, so exactly. if, as long as they are able to sell your stuff and you're happy with the amount that you're ma- making, then it's, it, 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 it would it would be like a perfect model right and i know of a couple of artists who say it works fantastic for them and and that's awesome 
Um, and for this first painting, they actually said, okay, like as an exception and welcome and gift, we'll actually uh, pay you the, the, your commission up front and we'll figure, we'll sell it. So I said, awesome. And so they, they came, they picked up the painting, they gave me a check, um, which was a significant check. And I was over the moon um, at the time. And, <clears throat> and the cool thing too, and this was also probably pretty serendipitous, but they, they brought it to their gallery. They hang it, they hang it up. And within four days, it sells to a billionaire, uh, like owner of, of, of the, the biggest, um, like a, a big hockey team here. Wow. Uh, he just walks in and says, I love that painting. He was building a new home, home in Whistler, his ski home. I, I, I want it. How much is it? I'll take it. And wow. the, yeah. So how cool so is they, that? That was incredible. Yeah. So they called me and they were like, okay, Lucas, uh, your painting sold. How many more can you make? <laughs> you know? <laughs> kind of rubbing their hands. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I was like, dude, like, uh, I mean, I guess they pr- this is probably not the norm, right? That's not every day I'm, I'm, that a male billionaire is going to walk in and, and just pick a painting up like that. But um, I guess there is a market for it. And so um, I figured, okay, if I do uh, like six or, or eight of those paintings a year, that was, that would kind of, I would, I, I, if I, if they if I sell right, and for every painting that I sell, I actually have to paint more. That's mm. what ends up happening. Um, like if I sell six or eight of those paintings, I can kind of quit my job and be okay. And but I didn't want to quit right at the time. Like it didn't sound it didn't sound sound to me to do that. Yeah. Um, so I kept on painting on the side more and more. And that is kind of also where the with the idea of in, at one point maybe talking to the owner of my company and saying, hey, like, as you know, like I'm doing more and more art on the side. Uh, this is picking up. So could we do an arrangement where maybe I come like just two or three days a week? I take mm. a less pay uh, and I can dedicate the rest of the days to my to my <clears throat> art. Like that would have been in my rational mind, the ideal transition. Yeah. Looking back, if it wouldn't have been the, the right thing to do either. But I figured, OK, until I'm ready to that point, I'm just going to continue juggling on the sides. But then what ended up, but that's the best thing to to do, isn't it? Really, with with like if somebody's thinking of or doing a side project, is to gradually phase it out. Would be the best thing to do, right? Yeah, I think I think that's that's my advice to anyone thinking of this, and whether it's art or or muse, I mean, whatever it is on the side. I think the best is to phase it out, and yes, you're gonna be you're gonna have to work more hours and and sacrifice some of your free time. But the reality is that once you're also doing it full time you're still going to be working double the time. So it's not that now I just replace my previous nine to five for my current thing. I still work like my nine to five and my uh, six to 10 uh, kind of thing and weekends on, on this uh, entrepreneurial thing. Um, but I think <clears throat> everyone should aim to do it, doing it gradually and just keep rolling with it and uh, until you're fully in the next thing until or unless something happens in the in the middle where you're just jump uh, like uh pushed into it which is what happened to me so i had this idea in my mind and i started painting more and more on the side and then there was a weird thing that happened kind of like uh where i had i had blocked some of the employees of this company from my instagram but that was this was like months ago um, just because I didn't want them kind of, I had the feeling that they were like kind of stalking what I was doing, <laughs> yeah. um, which felt kind of, kind of weird, but, <clears throat> and it felt weird because I would, I would, I would go into uh, the office and openly talk about what I was doing and kind of mm. try to pick up conversations and, and no one would like even show interest in it. And so I, f- I felt like they were, um, kind of annoyed or, or not happy with me doing that. So I figured, okay, like, I'm just going to block these people actually. Mm-hmm. Like, if, I guess if they're not happy for me, then. Uh, I don't want them looking at it. And so over the, over one Christmas holiday, I was um, like, I just took the, the two weeks off uh, of, of, of the end of the year. There wasn't any projects anymore. And I just said, Hey, like I'll take no pay, but I'll, I'd rather take this time to be with my family and do my things. And they were like, okay, fine, whatever. And during those two weeks, I just like sat down and painted a lot. Like I, I saw my family, but then I would paint as much as I can. And I finished a massive painting. And then when I go back to work, January 2nd, uh, I go in, I greet everyone. And then the owner says like, okay, uh, Lucas, uh, don't even take your coat off. You're, you're, you're finished. I'm like, what? <laughs> oh, well, uh, we, we saw that you uh, took this two weeks off from work. Uh, and actually you were um, 
uh, rather than being with your family, you were you were just like painting and working on your on your side project, and that you also blocked a couple of us from Instagram. And uh, so you were from my vision, you were trying to like hide this from us. So I can't have anyone like that that I can trust in my company. So um, I, that's it. You're done. <laughs> and I was like, okay, wow. like, I guess this is a I like I, I whatever like in my in my in my in hindsight. I kind of understand his point. You know, you have an employee, um, you would appreciate transparency. Mm. But from my point of view, I was always open. They just didn't show any interest. And whether I block people or not, like that's, you know, that's always this, the sketchy part. And it's something that's happening nowadays with social media everywhere. Where yeah, employers, yeah, difficult, like they get yeah. into people's personal Instagram and what you do there should not affect your, your work. But anyways, you know, like what, ha- what ended up happening is like, okay, January 2nd, I just grabbed my stuff and I sat in the car and I called my wife and I said like, Hey, I just got fired, you know? Um, and we had already been talking about me maybe at the middle of that year starting this transition. Uh, so she was like, okay, so what are you going to do? And I'm like, okay, I just rented a new studio because that's what I had done mm-hmm. uh, to have more space. Uh, I already have like all these paintings lined up. Um, I have the gallery who just like sold a, a second big painting. I have this little little bit of money there. I'm just going to go full into it. Like I'm wow. not going to go look for another job. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and I'm, these guys are not going to offer me now the, the possibility to work part time. So I might as well, you know, Double down, go big or go home. So you just jumped in. Wow. I just jumped in. Yeah. Wow. And it was it was fucking scary, I tell you. And I like bet. uh especially like the the angst at night sometimes of like, ah, uh, what have I done? Like, where is my next? Like, there's yeah. no there's no guarantee that money is gonna ever come back in, you know. So well, and, fair play uh, to you for doing it. It's a it's a big risk, but um it's uh, actually worked out okay so far. Well, you know, like uh, I can't say that I'm over those feelings, but it's been almost three years and I'm still surviving. So <laughs> yeah, you're doing something right. <laughs> Something's working. Yeah. And so did I, you, did you yeah. um, keep selling through the gallery and then have you also started to get private commissions from other clients? You're, you're a mind reader, Daniel. So yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. So <laughs> that's, um, that's exactly what happened. So because of social media, and I think this is, this is something that's been really great, not only for me, but for all, uh, visual artists who have embraced it in the last <clears throat> couple of years is that uh, a lot, so some people would discover me through the gallery, but a lot of people have discovered me through Instagram. And mind you, it's not necessarily the same clientele. You know, someone scrolling through in- Instagram isn't necessarily um, kind of shopping for a, I don't know, whatever, $20,000, $40,000 painting. Uh, they are maybe just like looking at their pets, looking at nature and all of a sudden, boom, an incredible painter pops up or something that they get inspired for by and start following it. So not, it's not necessarily that everybody who finds you on Instagram is immediately a client, um, but still it's someone you, you hook, latch on to. And then maybe that person knows someone who's looking for a painting and says, hey, look at this guy who I just discovered. Or maybe they follow you for a year and then until one day, you know, the <clears throat> and this happened. Um, uh, I don't want to say genders here, but one person in the, in the in the couple finally convinces the other person in the couple that it would be a great <laughs> idea to purchase a large investment from this artist they discovered on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> and then that person uh, agrees, and then we meet and and we we, we do a commission. So it started. Uh, what happened was um, like um, the gallery kept selling my stuff every now and then, although not with the, um, regularity they did in the beginning. So mm-hmm. two things happened actually. One was that. And then the second, like the owner of the gallery and I have nothing against her and, and she's, 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 um, just well known in, in, in the industry here and, mm-hmm. and her gallery is very, very established. Um, this is just my disclosure in case she or someone ever hears this <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and it's everything cool, but I got the feeling that, um, she started to, um, to, to, I don't know, to try to impose her way of thinking and her way of how stuff should be done uh, to me too much. And I'm unfortunately not a guy who, who takes, um, kind of, uh, advice or orders too well. Like if someone tells me, oh, you should be doing this, 
something inside of me uh, kind of wants to rebel against it. So even if it's sound, like it takes, it takes me a lot or two of, of like willpower to actually say, okay, yeah, I see what you're saying. You're right. I'll mm. do it. Especially when it comes to something like this, where like to me, the paintings, the creativity is something that sparks from inside of me. And if I'm not excited about it, then I can't do it right. So she started to giving me all this advice on, oh, you should be doing this and clients are not uh, so interested in your art anymore because you should be doing this and that and this and, and here this composition doesn't work and why don't you do this? And it, like maybe it was all, right, the, all the right stuff, but I rather go through my own mistakes, you know, and learn that by doing it myself and then by someone else telling me. Like in my mind, I wasn't hiring her as a consultant. I was just like giving them some of my paintings and if you want to sell them, if you can't sell them, amazing. But then let me do my own thing. <clears throat> and so they were kind of like, we just didn't, didn't, didn't jive very well. And then I was getting more and more inquiries and clients and people asking for stuff on my side. And then what happens too is like most galleries, they, they're, especially nowadays, they're pretty paranoid. So they really hate when um, artists sell outside of their control, right? Especially if you're like what's called like an emerging artist, someone who's just like starting up. So they, f- they kind of feel like they, they own you in a way and like you can only sell through them. And um, it's a bit of a weird psychology. Like if you're an established artist, of course, sell anything that you want at your own uh, studio. It doesn't matter. Just give us a few pieces here and there and we're, we'll be happy. If you're emerging, no, it's like very different. Like you only sell through us. And, and also if you sell on your own, uh, you should still be giving us a commission because we have no way of knowing if someone came to you through us, maybe, right? Someone walked into a gallery, took a picture of your name, then approached you and you're selling them, you're giving them a deal or we're not getting the credit for it. So uh, again, <laughs> they were stalking me and and it was it was just a weird feeling. And so at one point I kind of got to the conclusion. I, I approached them and said like, hey, like I'm getting actually more inquiries and sales through my own like through someone like a personal friend uh, commissioned me to do this painting then their friends wanted one why am I gonna give you 50% of that makes no makes no sense at all right and so um it got to a point where I I I just couldn't do it anymore so I told them thank you very much but uh I think I'm gonna move on and so I went and took all my inventory with me and and that was also pretty scary (laughs) But um, that since then I've been, yeah, self-represented. And mm. uh, that was two years ago. So yeah, th- th- that's essentially what happened. Like through my own network, it kept on growing and I kept on having more and more sales and commissions on my own. Yeah. And so what uh, personality traits would you say that, that you have um, that you actually think really helps you thrive within this art and creative industry? Um, one I would say is actually like the, the, the commitment to, to the work, you know, like the, mm. the dedication to it, the, the dedication to, to the really doing good stuff, um, to, even though some days I don't feel like it, like still go to the, to the studio and like put in the hours and, and getting the work done. So kind of that, that commitment to, to work is mm-hmm. one then the second one, and I think this is the one that helped me um, be able to, I mean, <laughs> uh, to, to, to do it on my own, right? To have my own relationship with clients. Mm. And there's a lot to improve here, but still it's like like a, a good, um, I don't know the word for like, just having a, a good personality. Like I'm, I, I can just, I'm okay dealing with people and, and making friends and friendly. Like I know some other artists who are like very recluse, and they don't want to speak to anyone or they're very like intricate in their mind yeah you don't often find the um the artist can also do the sort of in-person selling thing do you you know exactly it's it's often you're just like you say introverted whereas if you can do the extrovert part as well that's even better exactly and i have to say like i'm i'm not a great salesman and and none of that like uh, (laughs) there's people who are way better at it than i am but um, I, 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 I'm not afraid of trying to put myself into that situation and, and still trying to do my best, mm. but also like just being very genuine. I think like what um, has, has been my success with, with the kind of people that I sell my work to is um, being very open and transparent at where I am in my life and, and just sh- um, transmitting with them my, 
my enthusiasm about, look, I really love this. I'm going for it. I'm going for my dreams. I'm, I'm working hard for it. And uh, like, if um, you, you like to support this, I'm really, really grateful for it, you know? Mm. And most people who have like succeeded in their career and they have, uh, you know, the resources for it, they have some money over. It's it's only natural for, for someone who's well-intended and good-hearted to also want to help others out, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and also they know how hard it is to, to actually succeed, uh, or, and, and succeed doesn't mean necessarily making a lot of money. It's, it's just like, okay, you have a vision, you, you execute it and, and you're actually doing it in a way that society or whatever, uh, allows for you to, to profit off it and, and function within the, the system. Right. Yeah. And so they know how hard it is and uh, they, they see it in the system. So they're, they're happy not only to buy a painting that they like, they also like to support someone who's going for their dreams and, and, and accomplishing it. So that's it, kind of that's that, it. That, that, that honesty about it is something that has, uh, I think, really, um, really helped me. Um, 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 and what about your two biggest positives from um, you doing this and, and becoming a full-time artist? Well, one, uh, really the, the freedom. I mean, it's, it's a funny word because you, people always assume, oh, if I escape the nine to five, I'll be so free. And it's <laughs> not necessarily like that. It's like, not, is it? <laughs> no, not at all. Um, but I, I think the freedom is just like um, that, like every, everything that happens in my life, like it's my, it's, 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 it's my responsibility. So I, I have the the freedom to choose to do what I want. And I also am responsible for the choices that I make. Uh, and that to me feels really, really good, like really real in a way, right? Um, whereas if, if a lot of my decision-making and a lot of the stuff that happens to me is, is in someone else's hands, uh, that's something I didn't f- feel good with. Some people love it. Some people, okay, they're telling me what to do. I know what I have to do. It's, it's an easy life. And then I go watch, back home and watch TV um <clears throat> like uh, it's but it feels very numbing so for me that type of freedom um and then the second one it's of course like to to have something uh that i am enthusiastic about to do uh i i don't want to say every day but many days <laughs> yeah every day is not a good day isn't it you know oh, some, no, even people do what all. they love have bad yeah. days Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and then also uh, if I can add a third thing is that um, like the, the, the reward of, of growth, like if I look back at my life and I see like what these past few years have been like from starting out um, not knowing, like after they fired me, not knowing what was my life was going to happen, like where sales would come from then to going on, um, like self-represented, like, Every every time something like this happens, and then I look back, it's like, oh wow, like I actually figured it out. I grew, like I'm a, I'm a better version of myself, and stuff that I was wondering, oh, how could this ever be done? Like now I kind of figured that out, and that that feels super rewarding. Like having gone through something hard, and uh, still like figuring it out in a way. Um, so that that sense of growth, and that's something that I I feel it's very hard to find if you're just you know, going on a more traditional and standard route. It's definitely an old cliche, but it, I think it is true. When you go through something difficult, whether it be lost your job or whatever in your life, mm-hmm. when you mm-hmm. come out of that, you you do, you're better at things you, you previously weren't. It's just, it happens yes. for some reason. Totally, totally. It's like a big, like a big breakup or um, anything, you know, like you, that, that, that scarring in a way that emotional stress or uh, just, builds you up better and uh, so that that has been what does that kill us makes us stronger right Ooh, um, totally, cheesy yeah. that's <laughs> cheesy jules yeah. and, and so what would be some of the uh, the, the negatives or less favorable aspects of this industry that you've discovered um if you want to talk about the industry itself like the art industry is that there's 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 just such an overwhelming amount of of, of routes that you can take and some of them, unfortunately, um, can really kind of be disappointing, right? They can be like if if you end up 
signing up with a with a with a gallery that you don't jive with it will just like kill your creativity or if you end up not figuring out you may not ever get a sale and you may think it's just because you suck and maybe it's just you didn't have the right approach uh so it's so open and so free in a way that that there's so many places where things can not work out so that's kind of one negative aspect um then the other one I would say is uh, what, the opposite of what I was saying before, like the freedom that one has. That freedom and that responsibility, it's something really hard to manage. Um, and for some people more, more than others. I know some artists that are way more uh, disciplined and better at it than I am. And I'm certainly learning a lot. But for some people, they'll, they'll just, uh, they won't be able to, to, get it to, to get it together and, and, and get a routine going and it can just, yeah, be overwhelming, you know? So those are kind of two, two mm. negatives. And then also one thing, and this is true for every artist, is that uh, it's very easy to, to doubt yourself and judge yourself a lot, you know, because you're just, for it, for it to really work, you have to be all the time honest um, with yourself and with, with the work you're doing. It has to be genuine and it has to be really you, Right. Uh, if you're trying to pretend and it takes a while, like I can't say that I haven't pretended at some point or that I still don't like uh, do it now, but um, it takes a while to actually find your voice. This sounds very cliche, but, but when you go through it, you, you kind of see what it is um, like to, to this, to really discover, okay, what is it that I'm trying to say? And, and what does it look like? How do I put it out there? And you're, <clears throat> especially now in social media, like you, you enter there and this is the, I think one of the biggest pitfalls nowadays actually waking up and looking at what other people are doing on social media. Like that's the yeah. worst. Yeah, yeah. It's bad for you. I think, I think cause you just constantly compare yourself. Don't you? It's so stifling. And, um, that, that comparison trap, like really it's like, Oh, this guy already did this. Then I have to do mm. this other thing. And then you find someone in, I don't know. And, a country you didn't even know the word of who's better at this. And, yeah, uh, and, and that, realistically it doesn't mean anything like it shouldn't be any concern but it's so easy to find into that trap and then to always second guess what you're doing and to kind of actually think that something that's like what you really want to do say you want to paint i don't know anything like you want to do this and you're excited about this but then your mind for whatever reason tells you oh this is actually not a good idea i think this other thing would sell better and and then you try to do that so that second guessing that's also one of the negative aspects one could fall into yeah so we also like to talk a little bit about um, like basically what people could expect to kind of make income wise as yes. an artist. Totally. Um, we, we, we had an artist on before Carla. She does amazing uh, wildlife um, paintings. Really, Carla really Grace. lifelike. Yes. She came yeah, on yeah. from Australia. Um, nice. Yeah. She was, she was, she was great. And she was super How honest. How much does she make? No. <laughs> <laughs> you have to listen to the podcast, but uh, she was super honest. Yeah. And okay. it was because we kind of talked about as an artist, you, yeah. for example, have been painting for your basically your entire life. So you've built yes. up this skill set over years and years and years. And you don't just instantly make money with art. You have to build up a reputation. You have to build up a book of clients. So yes. for anyone listening, I guess what mm. we're trying to say is you're not going to start selling paintings for thousands of thousands of pounds. It's going to take years, right? Yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, if, if you've never done anything before, you're first painting is not going to sell for thousands that's uh, guaranteed <laughs> um so what would the question be like what would an initial salary look like or how long yeah. would it take to make money or yeah or... how long is it going to take realistically for someone to build a reputation and sort of start selling to make okay money you know survivable money i guess well, I'm going to start with the disclaimer that that's a really tough qu a question to answer. Yeah, because yeah, there's yeah. so many different things that could happen. Um, I don't think my case is the norm either, right? Mm. That like, I just got a call one day from a gallery and my first painting sold. And I'm going to be honest here, 38,000 Canadian bucks. Wow. And I made half of that. So that's not normal either. However, if someone think, oh, this guy got a lucky start, there were 25 years of painting exactly. behind that first sale yeah. right so even though yeah. that was my first gallery sale um it's not like oh on a whim i just decided to start painting so there was something there in the quality of what i was making 
But I would say for someone who already has some artistic interest and at one point says, okay, like I really like um, this style of art and I really feel passionate about this, I'm going to go and learn first. I would say it's going to take at least, I want to... I would like to be more optimistic, but I would say like three years of pretty consistent practice to kind of get sort of good at something. Um, yeah. Before that, you may think that it's good, but every painting that you do after that, it's you're going to look at your previous painting and say, oh, that's just garbage. Yeah, that's what that's Carla said, I think, actually. She uh, said that. Yeah. You always, the next painting you do, you look back and you go, oh, I could have done that differently. Of course, uh, that's, that's, but that's even true. I think that's that's a healthy sign. And mm that's true to me too. Like when people ask me, Oh, like, I love your work. It's so amazing. I love this painting. Like, which one is your favorite painting? I mean, and my honest answer is always like the next painting, because I look at <laughs> all of those paintings that you mentioned and I see all the stuff that I would like to improve. I, I uh, guess what we're saying for salary wise then is that. Yeah. Okay. Really, sorry. It's uh, not, it's okay. not about kind of how, because to ask you how much an artist can make is, is completely unfair because it's not like you say, it ranges massively but, yeah, no, but actually... I, 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 i'm okay to give you an answer so like i okay. would say it, it would take probably three years until you have something that's that's worthy of someone paying money for it right right i mean okay. of course you can sell your first drawing to your cousin or do the paint the portrait of of your neighbor's dog and sell it for 100 bucks like there's nothing wrong with that and there's many artists who in social media like immediately start maybe getting some sales but they're gonna be very like low prices and it's not going to be the type of art that will put you in the category of like um and this this category thing is a bit like unfair i think but mm. anyway but it is a thing of where you're actually an artist or where you are just like a craftsman who instead of doing custom furniture you're just doing custom art for people like um there is that category too and there's nothing wrong with that don't get me wrong like some people like, I mean, Carla's start, I think, was also kind of that. Like, she painted some landscapes, but then for a long time, it was like, just, okay, you want this pet portrait, you want this. Yeah, that's In my it, case, yeah. too, like someone asks for commissions, and of course, I'm going to paint the landscape that they want. I always try to make sure that they understand that it's going to be with my style, with my kind of uh, take on it. So even though they're telling me what landscapes they like, they're still painting, they're still getting one of my paintings. They're not getting whatever they want painted by me, just with my name on um but so like i think realistically it will take around three years to get something that you can sell like mm -hmm. for a couple of thousand bucks like someone even a gallery may may start to have a look at it you maybe want to have done like 20 to 50 paintings of that good quality stuff so maybe you did 100 paintings over those three years and that's being very optimistic and maybe mm -hmm. you probably did less but um, and especially if you are working on something that really requires time, it's not just splashes of paint. Mm. Um, so you're going to have like maybe, maybe 60, 80 paintings to get to a style that's good. And then you want to have 30 to 50 paintings of that style. Like this is being super like yeah, yeah, ideal sure. case scenario. Yeah. Then uh, you can walk like, or start to meet with galleries or discover them through Instagram. And maybe one will find you uh, uh, like interesting and, and start selling. And then I would say maybe in your first year, you can expect to make like a part-time salary, whatever country you're in. At. Sure. So if you, if you were here in Canada, maybe in that first year and, and you're really producing a lot of paintings, maybe you can make, I don't know, 30,000 bucks or something. Right. Um, just through painting sales, which is, I mean, don't get me wrong. It's, it's quite a bit of money, right? And to yeah, be doing yeah. it with something that you like, and that it's uh, on your own terms. It's actually amazing. Mm. Um, and also something that I always like to, to think of, even if we're working with a gallery, they're making 50%, but you have to think of, okay, how much actually is the market paying for my stuff? So say you make 30,000, it means actually the market paid 60,000 for your stuff, right? Got you. um, so that's, that's actually pretty cool. And because that kind of gives you an idea, okay, like if I were on my own, what could I potentially aspire to? Mind you, mm. once you start, it takes a while to get there. But then I would say maybe maybe three to five years into that, you can probably look at a, a, a decent uh, base salary of a f equivalent to a full-time thing. So maybe 
five years into working with a gallery, like three to five years, you can look at having at making maybe sixty to eighty thousand like Canadian dollars a year. Wow, I guess and, and this after is that, all... you're off to the races. Like honestly, and also yeah, about art and social media and all of these things. Is that there are so many alternative avenues that you can mm. go into, right? <clears throat> so, but this is all reliable yeah. on your your style and your painting and people liking your art and you building up a oh, following and you know course. there's so much else yeah, yeah. that goes into it, right? Absolutely. I mean, you can be doing, you can be painting all your life and no one likes it. And that's yeah. just <laughs> too bad. But I'm talking about something where like Carla's case, for example, I think it's great because of course she enjoys painting those portraits, but just by kind of looking in her and hearing her talk, like the videos that I see, I know she goes through the same stuff that I go through and that many artists go through where sure you're known for doing that, but also you're a creative person. So you appreciate a lot of things and maybe you don't feel every day like going and painting that that animal or maybe i don't feel every day like painting this mountain you know there's a hundred thousand things that i would like to paint that aren't necessarily a mountain but uh just you have to think of yourself also uh maybe this is another trait that i forgot to mention before you have to be able to <clears throat> take a step back of your inner artist and start to see yourself a bit as a as a business in a way as a brand and i know uh, as an artist, you hate hearing these words. I personally hate it too. When people will tell me, oh, like, what is your brand? You're like, fuck it. I'm not a brand. I'm an artist, you know, <laughs> uh, I do whatever I want. Uh, but still, like, you have to understand that people, like people who are now looking through Instagram, they, they associate, oh, Lucas, like, or they think, oh, who paints good realistic landscapes? That's, that's this Lucas uh, last name I can't pronounce. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if they're lucky, they type in the right few words and Google finds them for me, but uh, f- finds me for them. Um, but what I'm trying to say is like, I-, I got to this understanding of, okay, like, even though I would like to do all these things, like this is a, this is something that I can paint that I enjoy enough so that I can do it like on a con- on a regular basis, but there's also going to be a, uh, an acceptance, a taste for it in the market, right? It's, it's something that's realistic for me to put out there. Um, um, so, so, and I, I think that's some, that's a certain level of maturity that every artist aspiring to make that 30,000 first, 60,000, then 120, whatever much in the future has to also understand that whatever they produce, if they, if you find that sweet spot of something that's, um, that you enjoy doing, it's good and it's palatable for the audience, then you're just guaranteed success. You know, it's like uh, if te- if Tesla would make incredibly ugly cars, even though they're electric and they're passionate about electric cars, they probably wouldn't be. Uh, Elon Musk wouldn't probably be the richest guy on the planet right now. Um, I think some of their cars are actually pretty ugly, particularly that <laughs> Cybertruck. But uh, just before we wrap up, would you yeah. still go into this industry knowing everything you know now? A hundred percent. And I would recommend it to anyone who um, has that inkling inside and, or like, and, uh, or maybe someone who even finds themselves in, in the opposite situation, wishing they could like have some of this. I think like, if you have that inner urge, that's your inner, like uh, your Dharma, they call it in, in Sanskrit, you know, like I do a lot of meditation. I study all this, these traditions and they talk about Dharma. So we all come here with a certain like uh, mission, certain traits, some, something that for whatever reason, you're there to do it, right? And the mm-hmm. closer you're to that, the better everything is going to be in your life. And you know, you see this, like for some people, like they run a very successful business and you think, oh my God, like how could they deal with all this stress and all of this and all of that? And still you see them thriving. It's just because they're doing exactly what, for whatever reason, they're conditioned to, they're good at. And then you see people who are maybe very skilled doing something that they don't like and their life is misery and yeah and there's definitely something in that definitely yeah in that. and uh and it's not necessarily like oh this is your birth chart and you go to someone who reads a crystal ball you know <laughs> it's something that yeah yeah like this world is so um full of possibilities it's so multi um dimensional at the same time you know you have a a a, a a uh, guy running in um, his, his uh, like covered in, in, in leaves in Papua New Guinea, chasing mm-hmm. pigs, super happy. You have a stockbroker in New York. You have uh, you guys recording a podcast in, in the UK. You have me painting here in BC. Uh, 
and sure. and we're all alive at the same time and no one can say oh this life is what you should be doing this is wrong uh like this is what you should strive for it's really whatever you want so whatever you feel inside giving you that calling i think that's that's a great motivator that is that's a what you great doing. way to end yeah. the podcast lucas yeah so thank uh, you thank you so absolutely. much for coming on and chatting to us so we both really enjoyed your chat <laughs> thank you and uh, apologies if my answers were too long no, no they're great. brilliant it's great. okay okay just, just and, before you go where can people find yeah. you on social media and your art good question so um they can find me on instagram and my handle there is lucas l-u-c-a-s and then if they put a dot and k-r-a i won't even bother with the rest i should already look up <laughs> lucas Kratochvil. and the same with google if you put lucas Kra and art i should appear there my last name is originally czech my family's from austria it's really complicated and especially like the funny thing if i go to austria and i say Kratochvil, everybody is able to write it down no problem but outside of austria no one can so <laughs> that's kind of the bane of my existence and i wish i had something that's more marketable but that is what it is so Set they can apart. find me there and also if i can do a plug yeah, here yeah, yeah. this is something to um, um illustrate a point that i had before in last year with covid um i i did something that i was wanting to do for a long time but i didn't have the time which was to start um teaching painting workshops so a lot of people were seeing my stuff and they were like wow like do you ever teach i really like the style that you do i love nature like do you teach and i was like i i would like to but i honestly don't have the time and then last year uh, this happened so i started to uh, create these uh, online workshops which i teach sometimes live and sometimes pre-recorded and have them online and honestly like i've had hundreds of people from all over the world joining me over the course of last year and this year they're also coming and it's been incredibly rewarding for me to meet people from all over but also um i really wanted to create an opportunity for people to demystify oil painting demystify realism to be able to to easily learn this going step by step throughout the entire painting process so um i created this, these workshops really like <laughs> uh dummy proof in a way so for someone mm. who's never painted before and would like an introduction like they're uh they're like yeah they're they're super easy to 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 follow and digestible and also i i um i, I made them uh, really affordable like i put a pandemic relief discount oh cool or for people to be able to to join and follow along and yeah just through these times connect with nature arts and creativity which i think are stuff that's really uplifting you know and uh yeah, so Sounds excuse right. my plug, but that's something. No, no, and, yeah. And um, I think that's also something for for people thinking about the arts. Within the arts, it's not only, oh, you're only going to be limited to painting. There's all these other things you can do. You can teach, you can uh, do merchandising, you can do prints, you can collaborate with brands. So once you start opening your scope, and this is something you can do more freely if you are actually independent, uh, there are so many things that you can actually be doing to keep yourself entertained and, and also to yeah make a living. So yeah, uh, the world is endless, guys. Go get That's it. it. That's it. Well, thank you so much again for coming on, Lucas. We both really enjoyed the chat. Thank you so much for having me, guys. It was awesome. Cheers, Lucas. Bye-bye. Cheers.